This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. Thank you, Gleaves, for that generous introduction. I could spend uh, half of my evening telling you about friends and colleagues who have spoken to me through the years of Grand Rapids and Holland. This is my first time, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm honored. I'd like to begin this evening with a question. How many of you have been to the Lincoln Memorial? Almost everyone. <laughs> I want you to get in touch, perhaps with the first time you were there, maybe as a school child, so many school trips go to Washington. Or maybe recently you were there, maybe with children or grandchildren. Uh, the Park Service visitors tell us it is the second most visited place in Washington. Second only to the Vietnam Memorial, but I suspect last year, which was the Lincoln Bicentennial, it may have been the most visited place in Washington. You recall how you walk up those steps and the first thing you see is that tall, 29-foot high Daniel Chester French statue of Lincoln. Someone told me a few days ago she went as a child and wanted to get into Lincoln's lap. <laughs> Then you walk into what I call that temple space in a very noisy city. All of a sudden, everyone becomes quiet. If you turn to the left, carved on one panel is the Gettysburg Address. If you turn to the right, carved on three panels in Indiana limestone is the second inaugural address. Now tonight's going to be very interactive, so I want to ask you if you'd be willing, just a few of you to speak out, what was the feeling that you had when you were there a long time ago or perhaps recently. Would anybody be willing to just give voice to that feeling? Reverence. Reverence? The eyes. The eyes? Memorable. 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 Awestruck. Awestruck. Well, those words pretty much <laughs> pick up the feelings that we have. Some people have answered that question to me with tears in their eyes. Reverence, uh, memorable, awestruck. The reason that I have set out to write my books about Lincoln, and especially this new biography, is my conviction, however, that awe is not necessarily the same thing as understanding. You and I might go to a musical concert, and we might feel, my goodness, I, this music really did something for me, but that doesn't necessarily mean we understand it. When I was a student at UCLA, I sang in the a cappella choir. It was directed by Roger Wagner, who was the founder of the Roger Wagner Chorale. It was a remarkable experience. In our junior year, we sang Bach's St. John's Passion. And when it was over, Wagner, in his typical way, said, now next year, we're going to do something more difficult. <laughs> Beethoven's Misa Solemnis. And I had been literally moved to tears in seeing that beautiful composition, but I understood quickly afterwards, I don't really understand this music. So in my senior year, I took two courses for non-music majors, one on Bach and one on Beethoven. But all of us in this room, I'm sure, would say with President Gerald Ford that we have this reverence for Lincoln. But as was suggested by Gleaves in his introduction, there is layer after layer after layer. Is there more to understand? I'd like to suggest this evening an analogy that I want to open up just a few of the windows on Lincoln. Some of these come from recent scholarship that might surprise you. Is there anything new turning up of Lincoln? Well, about 20 years ago, for example, a professor at then Sangamon State College in Illinois got into his mind that if Lincoln had practiced law for 23 and a half years in Illinois, was it possible that there were any legal cases that were still sitting around in the 102 county courthouses of Illinois? So he dispatched a team of master students and they found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Lincoln legal cases in the basements of these courthouses. Invariably, they were rolled up. Many of them had turned blue with age and almost always Abraham Lincoln's name had been razor bladed out probably in the 19th century. The place where I work, the Huntington Library, put on a great Lincoln exhibit last year and the curator says that in a sense Lincoln was our first rock star and the way that you wanted to remember him was by his autograph. 
But of course, his, signature, his handwriting is so distinctive that it was not difficult to discern this was Lincoln's legal cases. So I spent more time in my biography than I'd anticipated talking about Lincoln, the lawyer. I spent more time than I anticipated talking about Lincoln, the commander in chief. He checked books out of the li Library of Congress to teach himself to be really our first commander in chief. Well, we know the story of all those generals who he needed to teach <laughs> until he finally found one, <coughs> Ulysses S. Grant. Perhaps the thing that attracted me the most and really intrigued me was how could this man of less than one year of formal education become this incredible person? Well, one way he did it is he would take little slips of paper and he would write out ideas or notes to himself, reflections, often beginning with a question. We've kind of missed them because they're scattered throughout the collected works of Lincoln. The editors called them fragments, but they're far more than fragments. For example, several of them, a number of them, actually focus on slavery. One of them, undated, but it's probably between 1854 and 1856, begins as Lincoln often did with a question. How is it that one person can hold another person in slavery? And then you can almost see Lincoln, the courtroom lawyer, walking around. And he says, well, could it be that the first person is more intellectual than the second? Could it be that the first person has greater economic standing than the second? Could it be, could it be, could it be? And at the end of the note, he simply writes, I cannot think of a single reason why one person can hold another person in slavery. In the last window that I will open for us tonight, we will discover a reflection that Lincoln wrote for his eyes only. He never thought we would ever see it. It was found after his death in the bottom drawer of his desk in the White House. And it just says so much about the journey, this private journey mostly, that Lincoln was on. Well, one window I wish I had opened more is Lincoln's humor. Today, humor sometimes, I think, is kind of a put-down humor. It's a hurtful kind of humor. Lincoln's humor was always laughing, not at other people, but at the culture in which he lived and mostly at himself. I love the story of Lincoln driving along in a buckboard one day, a carriage with William Seward. Seward, you recall, had been his chief competitor for the Republican nomination. Now he was his Secretary of State. Talk about an odd couple. Lincoln would walk across the street to Lafayette Square to Seward's house, when he opened the door, Seward was smoking one of his 20 cigars that he smoked every day. Lincoln never smoked. Then Seward would have this elaborate liquor cabinet. Lincoln never drank. Then Seward would start into one of his off-color, smutty stories. Lincoln didn't tell those stories. And yet these two men, Seward thought he was better than Lincoln. He was governor of New York, senator of New York, and yet six weeks after Lincoln's term began, Seward wrote a letter to his wife back in Auburn, New York, and he simply said, Lincoln is the best of all of us. Lincoln is the best of all of us. Well, one day as they were driving along, the road got rougher and rougher, and the driver started swearing more and more. And finally, Lincoln tapped him on the shoulder, and he said, my good man, are you an Episcopalian? <laughs> <laughs> and the driver, quite startled, was speechless for a few minutes. And then he said, oh, no. He said, I, I think maybe I'm a Methodist. <laughs> oh, he said, I thought you must be an Episcopalian. He said, you know, he said, you swear exactly the way Mr. Seward does, and he's an Episcopal church warden. <laughs> Well, the first window I want to open tonight is Lincoln, the politician. There's no real contradiction between Lincoln as a man of great ideals. I try to discern the interior moral compass that's in him, the fact that he's a very shrewd politician. But if you'll take the handout that is given to you as you came in, the first selection is the first campaign that Lincoln ever participated in. Barely 23 years of age, you remember he was born in 1809 in Kentucky, moved in 1816 to Indiana where he lived for 14 years, and then in 1830 he crossed the boundary into Illinois, 
stayed with his parents a bit, and then went off on his own to the tiny little village of New Salem. I had a lot of fun last year. My publisher said, I think you should speak in Chicago on February 12th, so I spoke at the Newberry Library, and I had fun telling the Chicagoites that when New Salem got started, they thought they had a much better future than Chicago. Because when Lincoln arrived, New Salem had 125 residents, and Chicago had 60. And they were going to navigate that Sangamon River, and Chicago was sort of sitting up there, isolated in the boonies up there, you know. And uh, so this is their future. Well, I think some people suggested Lincoln run for office. He could represent their interests. And the way you announced your candidacy was in the newspaper. And so barely 23 years of old age, he had just turned 23. Lincoln offers this introduction of himself. I think these words speak across time. Every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I can say for one that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. I'll vote for a candidate in 2010 who has that understanding of what politics should be about. How far I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. I am young and unknown to many of you. I was born and have ever remained in the most humble walks of life. I have no wealthy or popular relations to recommend. Well, his campaign interrupted by the Black Hawk War. Lincoln ran for the, the, the block of men running for so many seats in the Illinois State Legislature. Lincoln did not win. But in that region, where that territory where the votes were counted out of 305 votes, he received 279, the people who knew him best. Two years later, as he became better known, as he moved out in various vocations, there were 14 men running for four seats in the Illinois State Legislature. He finished second of the 14. And within two years, he was the leader of his Whig party in the Illinois State Legislature, the antecedent of the Republican Party. He then, after four terms in the Illinois State Legislature, his great ambition really was to serve in the United States Congress. They had in those days kind of a rotation system, and Lincoln was third man of, out of three. So finally, his turn came, and he went to Congress, and he wrote home to his law partner, Willie Herndon, I know you're all anxious for me to speak, to make my mark, and I will, just wait. Just wait. As freshman congressman, he spoke out in the most remarkable way. I need to say that in this appreciation of Lincoln, I found myself surprised that through the United States State Department, I was privileged to speak last year in Germany, Italy, and Mexico. In Mexico, I learned all about the American War. You and I thought it was the Mexican War. <laughs> I learned about the American War. <laughs> and I learned about the great Mexican hero, five feet tall, Indian by birth, Benito Juarez, whose great hero was Abraham Lincoln. And the mural in the great city of Monterey to the three liberators of the Americas, and Lincoln is there as one of the three liberators. This amazing affection I found in Mexico for Abraham Lincoln. So Lincoln did rather a startling move in his early month in Congress, and I have two selections here. The war with Mexico had already been going on for about a year, but there was a question, I don't know that we ever asked that question when you and I were in school, who started this war? It's just the assumption, of course, the Mexicans started this war. Listen to Abraham Lincoln. The House desires to obtain a full knowledge of all the facts which is to establish, which to establish whether the particular spot of soil on which the blood of our citizens was so shed was or was not our own soil at the time. For Lincoln believed that at the very least we had drawn the Mexicans by a provocative action, forcing them to fire the first shot, but more probably we had 
taken the aggression by moving into territory that had been understood to be theirs. Not a popular stand for a first term congressman. But wait, it gets better or worse. In January, just a few weeks later, he challenges the President of the United States. Now I propose to show that the whole truth of this issue and evidence is from the beginning to end the sheerest deception. And after analyzing President Polk's six propositions defending his action, Lincoln says this, let him answer with facts and not with arguments. And it's interesting, Lincoln was so imbued with precedent, not simply as a lawyer, but he so loved the precedent of American history. Let him remember he sits where Washington sat, and so remember, let him answer as Washington would answer. In escalating rhetoric, Lincoln concludes, I more than suspect already that he is deeply conscious of being in the wrong, that he feels the blood of this war, like the blood of Abel, is crying to heaven against him. That may not have been the Abraham Lincoln you studied in school. Lincoln found himself in a terrible dilemma. It's, a, it's almost a current dilemma. He said, well, then you don't support the troops. He said, no, I support the troops. I'm against the policy. I'm against what we have done. And I have discovered that Ulysses S. Grant, who is my next biographical project, fought bravely in the Mexican War, but at the end of his life, in his memoirs, he said, this was the most immoral war our nation has ever fought. I am deeply embarrassed by it. Well, this was not exactly a speech by Lincoln engendered to win friends. And quickly, this speech back home engendered all kinds of criticism. Even his partner offered this criticism. Lincoln came back. Yes, it was a rotation system, but he was told, thank you, you will never be elected to political office again. <coughs> and the Whig who followed him was defeated for political office to the Democrat. And Lincoln assumed part of the blame for his role in this. But remarkably, Lincoln moves forward, losing one bid for the Senate in 1855 debating Stephen Douglas in 1855 and winning by losing. There was a gerrymander system in Illinois. We don't have that anymore. <laughs> so that actually Lincoln had won the popular vote. But you may recall that the Senate was the one who elected a senator until 1912. And so the gerrymandered system allowed the Democrats to outvote the Republicans, even though they had less votes, popular votes, and Lincoln lost again. But then Lincoln is elected president of the United States. He stays for a long time in Springfield. It's a four-month time. We moved it up in, in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's second term to January 20th. And he prepares to leave. It's a remarkable scene. He goes to the train station in Springfield on that rainy, rainy February 11 morning. He has told the press that there will be no speech that day. As he walks into the depot, the newspaper correspondent, an immigrant from the New York Herald is there, and he says, Lincoln is so overcome with emotion, he cannot even speak. You can see the tears rolling down his cheeks as his dearest friends say goodbye to him. But as he steps outside, there are a thousand people waiting for him. And speech, speech, speech goes forward. It's sometimes been suggested that Lincoln might have prepared this speech. I don't think so. I think this speech is positively spontaneous, and I'll tell you why as we read it together. But let me say this to you. When I spoke in Berlin at the John F. Kennedy Institute, a part of the Free University last April, the largest American studies program in Europe, afterwards we went out to dinner in Berlin to an Italian restaurant. <laughs> And I was sitting next to a young German graduate student, and he said to me over dinner, you know what my favorite Lincoln speech is? And I said, no. He said, it's the farewell address to Springfield. And then he said it to me from memory in his second language. <laughs> my friends, no one in my situation can appreciate my feeling 
of sadness at this time. Lincoln always was wary about sharing his feelings. He distrusted emotion and trusted reason, but this time he allows his feelings, because I don't think he was prepared to come forth. To this place and the kindness of these people, I owe everything. Notice the simple sentences. I now leave, oh, and these words, not knowing when or whether ever I may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Is he greater than Washington? Absolutely not. No way. He understands that the task is greater than Washington. Well, Washington had a great task to lead this nation to its birth, but Lincoln understands that the task he is encountering will be even greater. And now listen to these words. This is not something people were ready or used to hearing. Without the assistance of that divine being, whoever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and ever remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care commending you, as I hope in your prayers you will commend me. And the audience in that day, it's hard to understand how this could happen today, but it happened then. You know what their response was? We will pray for you. We will pray for you. When Lincoln got off the train in, Ro in, uh, in uh, Rochester, New York, he rested on the Sabbath, and as he checked into his hotel room, he looked out the window, and here was this huge sign on the YMCA, we will pray for you. Amazing. Well, how did Lincoln rise? I believe that Lincoln distinguished himself from some very able peers by his gift of public speaking. Now, here we have a problem. I am terribly worried about our culture. We have a modern shibboleth. It's only words. I think we are devaluing words in our society. We are devaluing the beauty of the English language in our society, the care by which we should approach this. Someone told me at a previous stop that they had a contest for children in art and that the children would write their name on the back and they couldn't read the signet, they couldn't read the writing. So this year the teacher decided that none of the children would write their names and she would because the children couldn't write anyway. Well, we sometimes might want to think that Lincoln was simply a genius, even though he had but one year of formal education. He had this gift. You, you know the story. I used to ask people if they believed this, but I don't ask it anymore because it was too disconcerting to hear the results. I'll ask it, but don't put up your hand. Do you believe that Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address on the back of a flap of an envelope on the train to Gettysburg? Don't put up your hand. That story was told by a sentimental novelist at the beginning of the 20th century. She sold it as a book, the perfect tribute. She made it into a movie. She said that her son was told this by his teacher, who was told this by his father, who was told that by Edward Everett, who was on the train to Gettysburg, and he was not. <laughs> and that became required reading for in English for 25 years in the United States of America. What I want to suggest is that Lincoln, and I love to say this to students, I'm not sure how many students, maybe you're sitting in the back, there are some students. There is no such thing as good writing. There's only good rewriting. I can tell when you've turned in a paper that was written at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I write on the front of it, this is a first draft, it's not really acceptable. <laughs> Lincoln couldn't do what he did as a first draft. When the crowds gathered after the victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, and they wanted him to speak, and he didn't really want to because he often wasn't very good spontaneously, but he felt he had to, so he began, what was it, 80 some odd years ago that our, but four months later, give him time, it comes out four score and seven years ago, our forefathers. Well, Lincoln, as he traveled to Washington, had prepared and worked very hard on the drafts of his inaugural address. 
He did something quite unusual. He showed them the three Illinois friends and got their editing advice too, just simply said, great. He arrived in Washington and he met Seward that first Saturday. They went to church at St. John's Episcopal on Sunday morning. Seward entertained Lincoln for lunch that day. And Lincoln said to Seward, here's a draft of my first, at my inaugural address, he didn't know his first inaugural address. Would, sir, I know you're a fine speaker, would you be willing to look at it? If you have any suggestions, I'd be willing to hear them. That night, at parlor number six at the Willard Hotel, there was a knock. Lincoln opened the door and here was Frederick Seward, William's son, and he said, sir, my father has an envelope for you. Thank you very much. Lincoln takes the envelope and opens it. Here are seven pages of suggestions on how to improve his inaugural address. Seward had taken the text and numbered it in red ink, every single line. He made 49 suggestions to Lincoln. Lincoln accepted 27 of them with some modification. And then when Lincoln turns to page six, why he reads Seward's words, as for your last paragraph, forget it. I have written two new last paragraphs for you. You may choose which one you would like to use. <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, Lincoln chose one of Seward's last paragraphs to be his final paragraph of his inaugural address. If you'll turn the page. What I have tried to show you here, the column on the left, are the sentences uh, of Seward, and the column on the right is how Lincoln takes Seward's words and revises them into what I would call prose poetry. Seward begins, I close. Now, the best way that we would edit would be to cut extra words, extra adver adverbs, extra adjectives. It's very difficult to cut a two-word sentence, however. <laughs> so what, what is Lincoln doing here? He extends it. I am loath to close. To really understand Lincoln, I suggest that we need to read here his words out loud. In my books, I say to the reader, say these words out loud. I learned in studying American education that teachers ask students to read out loud until some afternoon in the 1930s when a frustrated teacher said something like, Johnny, you're disturbing Mary, please read to yourself. And we've adopted this habit of reading to ourselves. I say that the students in the room read your papers out loud and you'll get a sense as to what is being said. So may I ask us to say out loud Lincoln's first sentence and say it very slowly. You and I speak about 150 words a minute. Lincoln spoke only 110 or 115 words a minute. Let's hear what Lincoln is doing to change Seward. I am loath to close. Now what is he doing? He's extending the meaning. I am loath to close. I close. He is also doing what, in technical language, we would call assonance. He is putting, putting words of similar sound close together. He loves it. I am loath to close four score. This is part of Lincoln's rhetorical skill. Well, the second sentence, Seward says, we are not, we must not be aliens or enemies, but fellow countrymen and brethren. Barack Obama chose this sentence as his quotation from Lincoln in his acceptance speech at Grant Park in November of 2008. Listen how different it is from what Lincoln says. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Lincoln learns that less is more. It's a hard lesson for people to learn. We'll skip the third sentence. But now imagine to yourself that Lincoln on page seven of Seward's letter as he's standing there in parlor six at the Willard Hotel, he reads out loud Seward's words, the mystic chords which proceeding from so many battlefields and so many patriot graves pass through all the hearts and all the hearths in this broad continent of ours will yet again harmonize in their ancient music when breathed upon by the guardian angel of the nation
And I think Lincoln said to himself, my goodness sakes, what can I do with this? <laughs> but watch what he does with it. It's simply remarkable. This sentence, the final sentence of the inaugural address, is just filled with meaning and it still speaks to us today in 2010. Let's say it out loud together to catch its full meaning. The mystic chords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every heart and hearthstone all over this land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. One reason I've given this out to you is that you can take it home with you and look at it more closely. There are layers and layers of meaning. One thing that I think you may see quickly is that Seward ends by saying the guardian angel of the nation. Lincoln wants to make it more personal. He's calling the union to be together. So he says the better angels of our nature a much more powerful way of evoking a response from people. Well, I'd like to open up this window on Lincoln because it shows that all Lincoln is a great writer and a great speaker. He's able to take somebody else's words and change them into something that is poetic. We would not be reciting Seward's words this evening. He's got some good ideas, but Lincoln turns them into poetry. Just one more window. Of all the windows that were opened last year, I think the one that still needs to be opened more is Lincoln's religious journey. The traditional understanding has been that Lincoln is not a religious person. It is true that he never joined a congregation, but it's also true that he participated at First Presbyterian Church in Springfield and even much more at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, DC. In my biography, I suggest that a missing person in the Lincoln story is Lincoln's minister at New York Avenue, Phineas Densmore Gurley, number one in his class at Princeton Seminary, a learned, powerful preacher who had been invited just before Lincoln was elected president to return to the Princeton Seminary faculty as their professor of preaching. And I suggest that Lincoln listens to Gurley, especially does he listen in the greatest tragedy of their family's life they had lost Eddie in 1850 when he was less than four years old, but the death of Willie in February of 1862, the boy most like the father, Mary, I think, never recovered from his death. She wore her mourning clothes for 12 months. She wouldn't even allow Willie's children ever again to set foot in the White House, or his friends ever again to set foot in the White House because these little boys, his playmates, reminded her of her son. Well, Gurley preached the sermon that day, and he talked to the Lincolns and asked them to trust in biblical providence as the way of moving forward. Now, sometimes I like to give talks on Lincoln's second inaugural address. It's a remarkable address in which in 701 words, Lincoln mentions God 14 times, quotes the Bible four times, and invokes prayer three times. But I always know that I'll probably be met with questions coming from the audience. They usually fall into two categories. They're often accusations, but for, questions are often statements. You know, so that, That's the way it happens. So I would have someone make a question, really a statement, telling me, well, you must know, Dr. White, that simply to quote the Bible in the 19th century, I mean, that's what every cultured person did. So you must not make too much out of that. Lincoln quoted the Bible just like he quoted Shakespeare. Question two, uh, well, Lincoln, don't you know, was a shrewd president, he was, and therefore Lincoln is actually using the language of the audience. He understands that the audience is religious, so this is not really his language. There's really no integrity here. He's adopting the language of his audience. A lot of politicians do that. <laughs> Aha, but there's one little scrap of paper that I suggested at the beginning. John Hay found it in Lincoln's drawer. There'll be a wonderful documentary coming out in October of this year, co-sponsored by Frontline and the American Experience. It will be called God in America, six hours. And five of those hours will be rather traditional figures in the story of God in America, but 
through the wonderful person who's doing Hour 3, she and I are collaborating and we're going to make Lincoln central in Hour 3 and we're going to have what you have before you here central in that Hour 3. For here, Lincoln, at some point, it's been debated whether it was 1862 or 1864, he sits down, takes a little piece of, uh, of lined paper, there's no date on it, there's no title. This title was given by John Hay in 1872. I traveled to Brown University to hold that little piece of lined paper in my hands. And this is what Lincoln says. The will of God prevails. In great contest, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be and one must be wrong. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. The logical, lawyerly Lincoln at work here. In the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. And yet, the human instrumentalities, working just as they do, are the best adaptation to affect his purpose. I am almost ready to say that this is probably true, that God wills this contest and wills that it shall not end. Yet, think of it, Lincoln is the commander in chief. He's supposed to be ending the contest. But his private thoughts, he never thought we would see this. He's struggling with the question, where is God in the Civil War? By his mere quiet power on the minds of the now contestants, he could have either saved or destroyed the Union without a human contest. Yet the contest began. And having begun, he could give the final victory to either side any day. Yet the contest proceeds. How long do you think it took Lincoln to write that? Well, we just read it in about 60 seconds. I think it took him hours. Once he was sitting we don't have time for this anymore in our electronic age. And his secretary said to him, are you sleeping? He said, no, I'm thinking. My eyes are closed, but if you'll allow me, I, I'm just thinking here. I'm brooding. I'm reflecting. I'm contemplating. I travel through airports, and I see people just wired, wired, wired. And I think, do we have any time anymore to think, to reflect, to brood? That's where the deepest part of the human spirit resides. So this is a window that I want to open up. Does it define every aspect of Lincoln's religious belief? No. But more importantly, it says, here is a man struggling with the most significant question. We see Lincoln through the prism of his assassination. After his second inaugural address, he will be dead in 41 days. But he saw that address as the platform by which he would seek to be a peace president. He had become a great war president. He thought he would be a much better peace president. He said once in a lecture he was intending to give the lawyers, the lawyer has a supreme opportunity to be a peacemaker. Gamblers in the street were betting that Abraham Lincoln would be reelected and would serve three terms all the way to March 1873. There were no term limits. Whether he would have chosen to do so is another question. So Lincoln, I suggest through these words, somehow speaks across time. I'm an historian and I want faithfully and with integrity to try to place whoever we study within their historical context. Sometimes we ask questions of Lincoln that are unfair questions because we do not allow him to be a man of the middle of the 19th century. And yet I suggest to us that he's one of the very, very few people whose words still speak to us today in the commemoration of the first anniversary of 9-11, the people of New York City sought a poet or a politician who could give voice to those deep feelings. In the end, they simply recited the Gettysburg Address together. May I close with this? Lincoln was a person who had a great reverence for America's past. He had read the biography of George Washington. He revered Thomas Jefferson and his words, all men are created equal. But in his address to Congress, what we would now today call the State of the Union Address at the end of 1862, he offered these words, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate for the stormy present. The founders, as great as they are, passed on the issue of slavery. 
The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate for the stormy present. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. And I think Abraham Lincoln is saying to us this evening, with great reverence and hopefully knowledge of our past, which can imbue us with courage, that it is up to every generation of Americans to redefine ourselves in face of the contests and the issues we face in our own time. If we do so, I think we will find Abraham, Abraham Lincoln's initials carved on some tree. He was there before us. He can still be our guide today and in the future. Thank you very much. And now we have a generous amount of time for your comments and questions. I will repeat what anyone says so that we can all hear. Yes. Um, what do you, how do you personally feel about the comparisons made between Abraham Lincoln and our current commander in chief? How do I feel about the comparisons made between Abraham Lincoln and our current commander in chief? I think when I began to hear these, I felt I wanted to read Barack Obama's two books. And I, be, and, I, and I believe that Barack Obama has really tried to learn from Lincoln. I don't believe in any way he's comparing himself to Lincoln. So I think that, for example, he's got a terrific chapter uh, on the Constitution in his, uh, in his uh, second book. And he says towards the end of the chapter, and then I am left with Lincoln. Because Everett Dirksen, an uh, Illinois senator in the 18, in 1950s, <laughs> said, every politician wants to get right with Lincoln. So whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, a lot of people will say, give me a Lincoln quote for tonight. You know. <laughs> but that doesn't, it doesn't seem to go much further. So I think there's a real, you know, the use of the Lincoln Bible, the, uh, uh, the, the train ride, the, having his event at the Lincoln Memorial, I think there's something very real there. But I don't think there's a comparison. I think there's an attempt to learn. Obviously, the Illinois factor is, is very real, too. And the criticism that both came to office with, with relatively little experience. Yeah. Yes? Could you speak to Lincoln's moral courage uh, as compared to the political pressures that he got from the popular press at the time and his willingness to stand to his ideals uh, against uh, what might have been uh, the popular thought at the time during the Civil War. Could I speak to Lincoln's moral courage uh, in light of the, of the the popular press of the time, in light of the incredible criticism? It's hard to, sometimes we forget that Lincoln was criticized greatly by members of his own party, as well as others. I love the story that Lincoln would sometimes, this is a different White House, he would literally go out, of this, out on the street and hail a newsboy and get some newspapers. He loved to read newspapers. And the story is told that one Sunday afternoon, he's sitting around reading all these newspapers. And after about the seventh newspaper, he says, Lincoln, you are really a dog. <laughs> So the question that really energized me was, how does this interior moral compass take shape? Lincoln convenes his cabinet before the Fort Sumter, and every one of them but one says, do not attempt to resupply Fort Sumter. So then he calls in the leading generals, do not attempt to resupply Fort Sumter. It would take us 12 months, and we'd have to raise 16,000 men to even make the attempt, and then it wouldn't be successful. And so Lincoln somehow is this, what I call an inner directed person. He listens carefully with respect, but he somehow has his own interior moral compass to do what is right. Senator Charles Sumner was always on his case for trying to move more quickly on the emancipation, on the emancipation of African Americans. And he said to him one day, Senator Sumner, he said, you and I are actually in the very same place in terms of our views. We're just operating by a different clock. <laughs> yes? Do you have any comments in addition how frustrated Lincoln was with his generals 
<laughs> how he replaced them, and how he came to make those decisions. Do I have anything to say about how Lincoln was frustrated with his generals? People have, uh, and how he made those decisions, people who have read my book have said, well, you didn't tell us enough as to why he didn't fire McClellan sooner. Well, one reason he didn't fire McClellan sooner was that McClellan was very much valued and appreciated by his troops. When McClellan had been demoted and then promoted, McClellan goes to the edge of the city as the troops are coming in from one more defeat. And when they see McClellan, they are just enraptured. They love this man. It's hard to understand why, but they did. But here's something about Lincoln. When Meade won the battle at Gettysburg, a tremendous victory for the North, Meade did not follow it up. And Lee took his badly wounded troops and day after day finally made a retreat. He got to the Potomac. The Potomac was flooded and he could not get over. And day after day he was stopped and Lincoln was so frustrated by this. Why me? Don't you go after him? And finally about 13 days after Gettysburg, Meade finally has a troop get to the Potomac River and Lee had just passed over with his entire army. So Lincoln sits down. And he writes this letter to Meade. And I'll tell you, he lets him have it from one barrel after another. But in the Lincoln papers, there is a letter to George Meade. And on the envelope, it simply says, never signed, never sent. For Lincoln understood that if he would have sent that letter, he would have crushed that man who had won such a great victory. But in the very same moment, after Vicksburg, he writes a letter to General Ulysses S. Grant. And he starts out by saying, dear Dr. Dear, dear General Grant, I do not believe that we've ever had the privilege of meeting. I simply want to say to you that when you decided to take your troops into Mississippi, I thought you were wrong. When you went down, I thought that was a mistake. When you did this, I was convinced that was wrong. I simply want to say, General Grant, I was wrong, and you were right. Sincerely, A. Lincoln. <laughs> amazing. At least I think it's amazing. <laughs> I'm struggling with the lights here, but yes. What do you think drove Lincoln to educate himself? Hmm. What do I think drove Lincoln to educate himself? How unusual for the time. Boys went to school, if at all, in the winter months when they could not farm, when the fathers could spare them to do that. His own father did not encourage, not, not it was against education, but a boy, that big strapping young boy who was spending his time reading, thankfully Lincoln's stepmother affirmed what he was doing. And somehow Lincoln saw this, did he see it as a way out to a larger world? I think reading often is an exercise of imagination where we travel with Bunyan to England, where we go all these places that we can never go, especially in that world where we'll believe we never travel 25 miles from where we live. And he didn't do it just as a young person. I mean, there are young people who work very hard to do this. He did it all through his life. So when he came back from Congress thinking he'd never run again, heads out to the Eighth Judicial Circuit, what does he do but he buys himself a set of Euclid's Principles of Geometry. And at age 40, his fellow lawyers wake up at 11.30 at night, and here is Lincoln by candlelight reading Euclid's Principles of Geometry. And they say, what in the world are you doing? He said, I am trying to teach myself to think and to reason in a more disciplined way. He was a lifelong learner. Yes? Can you speak about uh, with Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary and how much she was responsible for some of his political ambitions? Yes. I would like to speak about Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary. Mary seems to have come in for a lot of bad press re through the years, but especially recently, a lot of attacks upon her. Well, we know we can't get inside anybody else's marriage. I think they had a, a loving marriage. I think they had both a romantic marriage, but they had an intellectual marriage. Most girls of that era would have had four years of education. Her father believed in the education of his daughters as well as his sons. She had quite an education for a young woman of her time. She could speak French. 
And I think Lincoln saw this as quite remarkable. She was also very ambitious for him. I think she saw in many ways how far he could rise before he did. The sadness in a way was that she was his counselor, I think, when they lived in Illinois. When she got to Washington through her own travail, through his friendship with Seward and the members of his cabinet, inadvertently perhaps I think she was pushed aside or felt she was now pushed aside. So she lost her place and I think this was very difficult for her. So, and then the women of Washington treated her terribly. She, she was a cultured woman, but they treated her like a Western rube. And so this was really hurtful to her. She didn't help herself at times. <laughs> I mean, she could overspend the budget. The John Hay called her a hellcat. Lincoln often just walked away when she got pretty stormy with her temper. But then the loss of one son, the loss of a second son, and finally the loss of a third son. I mean, my goodness, the woman endured so much. Yes? Uh, yes, sir. Do you, do you think the whole issue of civil rights would have been different had Lincoln lived? Well, do I think the issue of civil rights would have been different? Yes, I do. And that's one reason he didn't live. The last speech that he gave after Appomattox, John Wilkes Booth was in the crowd. And Lincoln mentioned that perhaps those blacks who had fought for the Union deserved the right to vote, and perhaps others of intellectual ability might deserve the right to vote. And John Wilkes Booth turned to his friend and said, that's the last speech this nigger lover is ever going to give. So, you know, today Lincoln has been attacked by some African Americans. You can take things out of his speeches. He was a man of his time. In the fourth debate at Charleston, he said, it's not that I'm about to marry a black woman. It's not that I think blacks should serve on juries. But then often those who cite this stop there. But Lincoln didn't stop there. Those are debating points. He is conceding, conceding, conceding. And then he says, but this black woman in her right to earn the bread she does from her own hands is every bit my equal and the equal of every person in this crowd because all men are created equal. She's not social equal, but he believed that Thomas Jefferson's words meant that she had a kind of political equality. So it would have been a tough battle and Ulysses S. Grant encountered that battle. The, the twin demands of both trying to allow blacks to have their rights in the South and yet somehow trying to bring some sort of reconciliation between South and North, that collided in the years of Reconstruction. I think Lincoln would have been the best positioned person. He would have blended strength and conciliation. Yes, please. <laughs> in an age before Prozac, how was Lincoln <laughs> able to overcome his depression and become so effective even though he was prone to melancholy. How was Lincoln able to be effective struggling as he did with depression, melancholy? Uh, I learn a lot from speaking at places like this and in the last six months I've met two psychiatrists who've helped me answer that question. <laughs> they both said the same thing. They said, do you know, I didn't know, they said lots of people suffer from depression. Why? Because they are more in touch with reality and the pain of reality around us. Whereas some people who are kind of, isn't it a wonderful day, it's a great day, <laughs> nothing wrong with that, but they're not as much in touch with the pain around them. So in a wonderful book by, uh, uh, called Lincoln's Melancholy, the suggestion is that Lincoln's own personal struggles actually worked to make him more empathetic to the struggles of others. It made him more sympathetic to others. And, and, and that maybe that's the way it worked. After Willie's death, you know, he said to Mary, he said, I, 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 I cannot get down here with you. I must be the president. And on their last afternoon before they went to Ford's Theater, she reported the conversation. He said, I'd like to go to California maybe to the Holy Land. He said, Mary, this has been such a terrible time for us. We have been so unhappy. We must become happy in the next few years. We must change our spirit. So part of it, I think, was his own will to say, I, I can't live in this space. I've got to live in a different space. And that's not easy to do, but I think he could do it. Yes? I wonder if you know much about Robert Lincoln. A little bit. 
Robert Lincoln was uh, the, the oldest son. For whatever reasons, this is hard to discern. It's often been suggested that Lincoln was not as close to this son as he was to the younger boys. Uh, he's, Robert Lincoln has also suffered a bad press because he is the one who put his mother in an asylum afterwards. But recently, at Robert Lincoln's home, Hill Dean, which he built in the early 1900s in Manchester, Vermont, it's now a wonderful Lincoln Center, a young scholar found, can you believe this? This is why history still is a detective work. About seven years ago, just opening a drawer, and here were the letters between Robert Todd Lincoln and his mother. And what it reveals is, if you've ever been involved in this situation, it reveals a Robert Todd Lincoln who placed his mother there to help her, not to punish her, not to confine her, and that there's kind of an understanding of this. He goes on to have quite a career, both in business and in politics, and lives all the way up into the, uh, is it 1921 that he dies? A long, long life, yeah. Yes, way in the back. Speak to the relationship between Lincoln and Frederick Douglass? Ah, yes. Uh, the relationship between Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was the greatest African American of the 19th century who had escaped from slavery, taught himself, became newspaper editor, reformer. He followed the Lincoln Douglass debates. He was intrigued and appreciative of the side Lincoln was taking. Uh, uh, Fred, uh, Stephen Douglas called Lincoln 39 times in the first two debates a nigger lover over and over and over and over again. He called him this. But Frederick Douglass was very disappointed with Lincoln's first inaugural. It was too conciliatory towards the South. He was excited when the Emancipation Proclamation opened the door for black soldiers but quickly disappointed he had traveled recruiting these soldiers because he found that they were not being paid equally and not being treated fairly. So the general in charge, a white general, said, go and see Lincoln. He said, ha, that, that won't happen. He said, try it. He arrived and put his card in. People waited days to see Lincoln. They all showed up. In 10 minutes, the door opened, and Abraham Lincoln stood up to greet Frederick Douglass. That Sunday afternoon in Philadelphia, Frederick Douglass told a crowd, I know how I am being treated by white people. I have never been treated with so little prejudice and so much respect as I was by President Lincoln. It's not that I necessarily agree with him on everything, but the next year, Lincoln, after the Emancipation Proclamation, called in Douglass and said, you can do something I can't do. We have got to get these slaves moving towards the Union lines. That's their only hope. You've got the network. You can make it happen. I can't. Douglas was there for the second inaugural address. He looked around him. He heard the crowd in the back, the African Americans who had never been there before, start the chant three quarters of the way through the address. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, they understood what Lincoln was saying. Douglas wrote in his diary, this was not a state paper, this was a sermon. He then wanted to go to the inaugural ball or reception at the White House, but the old rules inadvertently were in effect and he was turned away the first time by the police and the military. He got inside a second time and they tried to push him out a window. And he said, tell President Lincoln that I'm here. The word went forward, and as Lincoln was standing in this huge crowd, Lincoln says in a loud voice, here comes my friend Douglas. Wow, the crowd quieted. He said, Mr. Douglas, I'd like to hear what you thought of my inaugural address. Oh, he said, no, Mr. President, there's far more important people here. No, I want to hear what you thought of my inaugural address. Mr. President, I thought it was a sacred effort. After Lincoln's death, Mary Lincoln sent to Frederick Douglass's, Douglass Lincoln's cane because she said, my husband thought of you as a dear friend. Now in future years after Lincoln's death, Douglass would have mixed comments. You know, he was a white man's president, but on the other hand, he traveled faster and further on civil rights than any white person. So it's a complex relationship. I think Douglass helped teach Lincoln, and I think Lincoln showed respect to Douglass. That was too long an answer, but I... <laughs> yes? I've got a real challenge for you and the rest of us. Okay. I've been flooded with mail lately, and it's this God in America that you're talking about, we're going to see, and uh, several 
ex-senators, so forth, need me now to donate so we can fight this atheist and agnostic groups that actually, with their high-priced, well-paid lawyers, have recently won in a court that they want to start taking down the crosses in our federal military cemeteries. And I am mad. <laughs> and most of us here, I think, are mad. But they feel we're infringing on their rights to have, and, and it's the Ten Commandments, they made them take it out of some city hall. We can't have the preach at Christmas on public land. Can you enlighten them? What's your opinion? Well, you've, you've said a lot here, just to, you know, that, that, that I want to make sure that people heard it, that, you know, the, the, the movement to take crosses uh, to have a kind of a anti-Christian, anti-religious stance. First of all, let's be clear about the First Amendment. The First Amendment has two clauses. The First Amendment was not ever intended to disenfranchise religion or the churches in America. It was embodied or enacted by people who had come from nations where a single church had been the established church. So it simply wanted to say there will be no one church that will be the established church. Even Thomas Jefferson in Virginia said, well, I'm a Anglican, but if I look around me, there's far more Baptists and Presbyterians. Why should there be a law establishing the Anglican church? I don't, that doesn't make any sense. That needs to be understood. On the other end of the spectrum, yes, we do live in a much more multicultural and multi-religious nation than Abraham Lincoln lived in. But I think that it's a difference between the separation of church and state and to say that there can be no relationship of religion and politics. The Christian faith, by its very nature, is not simply personal, it's public. And therefore, Lincoln, I think, interestingly, can be our guide. I think we can be respectful of those of different persuasions, but this is part of who we are as a nation. And Lincoln says it so very clearly. And so there is a place for religion in the public square. There is a place for children to be able to have clubs in public schools, you know. Sometimes religion has been its own worst enemy when it's been intolerant or arrogant, but I think there is a place for this. And uh, it's a complex question, but I think this would be denied who we are and would really be to misunderstand the First Amendment. Yes? Yeah, I had a question that I don't know that I ever uh, heard <laughs> any discussion of. What was Lincoln's relationship with his vice president? Uh, interesting news. Right, right. Well, vice presidents were a very, very, very minimal role in that day compared to ours or certainly the last 50 years. So Hannibal Hamlin uh, changed his politics a lot in the four years. He didn't have much of a role. He didn't even sit on a cabinet meeting. So he returned to Maine and sort of joined the Coast Guard during the, during the four years. And, and they didn't have much of a relationship. And then the, the real question, which may never be answered, but I think it's probably pretty clear that I don't believe that Lincoln selected Andrew Johnson as his vice presidential running mate. I think he probably said what was called in 1864 the, the National Union Party. You select someone, and, and Johnson was in some ways a logical candidate because here was this southern senator from Tennessee who had remained loyal to the Union, so he was a unionist. So they selected Andrew Johnson. They didn't really know each other. And I don't think Lincoln had a hand in selecting it. And of course, no one imagined what might happen. Yes? <coughs> Many interesting insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. insights on his relationship with his father? Hmm. Do I have any insights on his relationships with his father? This is a difficult one. Uh, the father's not a bad guy. The father has some of the characteristics of the son. Then we've had a gift of humor. There's been a debate on how successful he was. I think it's wrong to say he was not successful. He was a pillar of the Little Pigeon Baptist Church, helped build the church in Indiana. But he never appreciated the boy's intellectual curiosity or his desire to read books. And therefore, he kind of resisted this. He also perhaps did something that was really inadmissible 
boys by the time they were 13 or 14 would begin to work on other people's farms and they would return the money to the family, but the father would give 10% of the money back to the boy. It may be that he did not give the 10% back to the boy. So there grew up this difficult relationship. And uh, when the father died, he did not go to the funeral. And he wrote a letter saying at one point, that if I came, it would only be worse than if I didn't come. And that's hard to defend. I mean, whatever our relationship is with our parent, this person is our parent. Some of us have had to discover we make peace with our parents, even if we have a difficult and rocky relationship. So it's hard to fully fathom this, but it was a conflicted relationship. And uh, how that works itself out, well, Lincoln then became this guy who couldn't discipline any of his four boys. I mean, he was well all over. You know. Mary was a disciplinarian, and he was the he was a teddy bear, who just, but he loved children, and he loved the children in the neighborhood. So I, I try to talk about that in my biography, but I don't know where to get to the end of what's really underneath all of this. Yes? Emily Todd Helms, the younger yes. sister yes. of Mary. Yes. How did she affect the marriage of Abraham and Mary? You're asking, how did Emily Todd Helm, the younger sister of Mary, affect the relationship? Do you, could you say more? Did you think she did affect it in a certain way? Or? She did. Pardon me? I think she did. In what way? Um, after her husband was killed yes. in the Battle of Chickamauga, right. uh, a general in Chickamauga, yes. um, she faced a certain amount of social ostracism in Kentucky and moved yes. to Indiana. Mm -hmm. And at that point, um, having lost her husband and her home, was very vocal and anti-Lincoln for a time, was she not? Yes, she was, yes. Now, I, you know more than I do. I, I don't know, if this is Mary's younger sister, how, it was, how that affected their marriage. I mean, Lincoln had the difficulty that Mary's relatives were mostly Confederates, you know, and the character. One living in the White House for a while, that was pretty difficult. But, but this was this was Lincoln, and he, and he, he took a great deal of criticism for this. This didn't bother with that. You know, this was family, and this was what Mary wanted to do, and he was very supportive of what she did. I hadn't quite thought about how this might have affected their marriage. I mean, Mary and, and, and Abraham sometimes disagreed on political candidates they had through the years. Yes? With the founding of our country, it seems like we've had this balance of tug of war between federal and state government. Yes. With Abraham Lincoln, it seems like he's kind of tilted the balance towards the federal government. Yes. What's your viewpoint? How did how has that played itself out? Well, this is a, I don't like to talk about contemporary politics, but your question is an interesting one in the sense of the, you're raising this question of the balance between the federal and the state governments. What's really curious is the two parties have changed sides. And the Republican Party was the party that had favored a larger federal government. Why was that? Because Abraham Lincoln, as a young politician, believed that internal improvements was the only way this country was going to grow. And this could never be done by a town or a, a county or even a state. So the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, land grant, moral land grant, this is something the federal government this, and, and so, in a sense, he's become criticized by people today, I learned, not simply by the sons of the Confederacy, but by libertarians in other parts of the country who argued that Lincoln was the beginning of this terrible imperial presidency. He was the beginning of big government. <coughs> now, you could argue that in any war, whether it's Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, or Franklin Delano Roosevelt, almost naturally, he, the president was the commander in chief. <laughs> The, the power of the presidency is probably going to grow. But Lincoln did believe that there was a role for the national government, and when he came into office, the phrase was, the United States are. When he left office, it was, the United States is. Robert E. Lee decided against the United States and for Virginia. He detested slavery. He was against secession. They decided to serve the state. But Lincoln had this incredible 
belief in the union, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, who had served with Lincoln in Congress, said Lincoln's mystical religion was the union. He believed the union predated the founding of the United States. It was present in 1776, and the union was always larger than the states. And that was part of his view that, the, that this federal government, aware that you know, the early fear that we didn't want a king or a monarch or a dictator, but in this huge country, you needed to have a federal government that had some power to move and build this country. One last question. Yes. The president seemed to be a humble person. I asked you to speculate a little bit. Had he been able to somehow see the magnificent memorial out there on the wall and then that, <laughs> that, that tremendous statue, what do you think his reaction would be? That's a great question. Uh, President Lincoln comes across as a humble person. What would he think of the Lincoln Memorial, <laughs> this great marble statue on the wall? In a certain sense, isn't it? it it's a little bit uh, kind of odd. I mean, it's almost anti-Lincoln. I mean, we love it, and I love it, because of, of what it means. But I mean, it's not exactly, or you go to the, the Lincoln birthplace in Kentucky, and it's, my goodness, it doesn't look like a humble birthplace at all. You know? But that's probably who we are. We, we want to create monuments to those who are our greatest heroes. And if we're just aware of that a little bit, why that, that can help us put it into perspective. And if we can tell our children and our grandchildren that this really is humble, Abraham Lincoln, that's the message we need. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gvsu.edu.